When Thrust SSC returned from the Black Rock Desert in 1997, the project that had successfully delivered the world's first supersonic land speed record was gradually shut down. The car found a new home at Coventry Transport Museum, and many of the spare parts and support equipment used for the record attempt were sold. However, the car's two spare jet engines quietly went into storage awaiting a new project. 25 years later, with the Thrust team taking aim at the world water speed record, those spare Rolls-Royce engines are a core part of the new project. In the last update, we saw how the team overcame part supply issues and the lack of available testing facilities as they recovered the engines from storage and prepared to run them up to full military power. In a hardened aircraft shelter, or HAS, at Cornwall Airport Newquay, the Rolls-Royce Spey 205 jet engine has been bolted to a custom-made test stand, which in itself is anchored to the concrete floor. The test team are ready, with cables running from the engine to a porter cabin containing all of the necessary control systems. But what's the story behind this famous engine, and how exactly do you start a jet engine? Dick Beckett, now retired, was chief engineer at Rolls-Royce and looked after the company's engine programs for both military jets and Concorde. He's now advising the WSH team in their use of the Spey engine. I joined Rolls-Royce in 1964. I was a, started my graduate apprentice with an announcement over the tannoy that they had got this contract for the, the Phantom. The first run of the Spey 202 was in mid-1965. I joined the development team um, late in 65. Spey development was all about the turbines. The compressors were, were behaving themselves quite well. Um, what we had was to get a life into the turbine blades, and in particular, the HP2 blade went through, during the life of the engine, four separate standards. It was forged, conventional, directional acidified, and then single crystal. Forged was what was available. Cast became fairly early in the program, but then we had the DS, and that we weren't able to use um, because there was the complication of the Chinese. They bought the Spay 202. All the technology, all the design, and all the manufacturing know-how. That did not include the ones that were effectively the, the 205. We were not allowed to let them have directly acidified or single crystal uh, technology into China. So the 205 came because it was then going to be a renewed engine where we could up the amount of power and also control the life to a much a larger amount than what we had. Engine specialist Dick Barton retired from a career in the RAF servicing the Spey engine in Phantom Jet Fighters. So how do you start and control an engine like this? The Palust is a piece of ground equipment that uh, is a small gas turbine which is designed to run up to speed and then open a valve to release excess air from the compressor that feeds a starter motor which is on the engine itself. Once it spins up the HP, that induces airflow in the engine and, uh, and spins up the LP comp compressor. It spins it up quickly and re really very quickly, up to uh, about 36, 38 percent. You don't need very much to run uh, a gas turbine. All you need to do is spin it up to speed, put fuel in and light it at first. Then it's self-sustaining. From then on, your control is how much you pour fuel in and your control for your top end, which is controlling the temperature through the turbine. The throttle input on the aircraft is just uh, mechanical. To actually run it on the boat and uh, on the stand, we had to fit a stepper motor. So it's electronic feed. 
All we need is really the instrumentation so we can read uh, engine speed, HP shaft speed, which is most important, LP shaft speed, and temperature. Once we've got all those, we've got control of all the limitations on the engine. The only other thing you really need is the feed during the start cycle for the igniters. But the first thing that we would turn on is the tornado fuel pumps. And that's the first thing you'll hear is the power of the, the, the pumps and then opening the LP cock so that we know we've got fuel to the engine. Pumps on. Fuel cock open. Then we spin up the post. It starts up and everything control-wise is then in the control cabin. I'm just making sure that nothing's going on fire or leaking. What they're looking for in the control room is uh, as soon as they get the 10%, you open the throttle. 10% first ignite. So then you're putting fuel in at 10%. 20%. The igniters light the fuel and then you're just waiting to get up to self-sustaining speed. I have to listen to speeds and I'm waiting for 40% and I'll shut out the pollute. Because it's already above a speed where it can self-sustain. That's all I'm waiting for is him to get a 40% so I can knock off the pollute. And then it's just a matter of leak check and then back out into the control room. Also, when you go up to above 80%, you will see that there's a cooling air outlet duct on the side of the engine. And that releases the air that is used for cooling and sealing. And that will blow some oily smoke out of side. Because it's sealing oil seals, it will get a little bit of oil in that air and it, it will blow up the side. So you will see that as well.
25 years since it last saw the light of day, the Spey 205 that will form the heart of Thrust WSH's water speed challenge has been successfully tested. The team's ingenuity and problem solving have resulted in a giant step towards their ultimate goal. However, breaking the world water speed record will need a lot more power than has been on display in this test. For that, the engine will need to run in full reheat and to test that, the team will need a much bigger facility. Stay tuned, subscribe to the Thrust WSH channel and you'll be the first to hear what happens next.